Kayla Unbahoun was born on July 5th, 2008 to Ryan Iskirka and Heather Unbahoun in the western suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. Ryan and Heather split up when Kayla was still very young, and a judge awarded Ryan permanent custody. In 2017, Kayla was spending July 4th with her mother. She was scheduled to be returned to Ryan the next day on her ninth birthday. The next day, however, Heather and Kayla did not show up for the court-ordered exchange, and the police were immediately contacted and an investigation was launched. It was discovered that all of Heather's social media had been deleted and her phone turned off. Police determined that Heather was last seen packing her belongings up to the roof of her car. Her closest family members indicated she went on a camping trip to an unknown location in Wisconsin and was expected to return on July 5th at 7 p.m. to return Kayla to Ryan. After Ryan filed missing persons reports for both Kayla and Heather, Heather was charged with child abduction, a class four felony. Since then, South Elgin police pursued numerous leads and tips, working with police agencies from around the country in an attempt to locate Kayla and Heather. Ryan set up a GoFundMe page. He was appealing for donations and information to help with the search. He wrote on GoFundMe that he planned to use the assistance to hire a private investigator and any additional cost concerning the search for them and their health and safety for when they are found. The safety and return of Kayla is the top priority of all my family and I, and any help we receive through this funding is greatly appreciated, he wrote. Between July 2017 and May 2023, the page raised just over $2,500 towards its $10,000 goal. In November 2022, Kayla's picture was featured on an episode of Netflix's Unsolved Mysteries. At the end of the episode called Abducted by a Parent, missing posters and age progression images are shown from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. For just under five seconds, a photo of Kayla at nine appears on screen alongside a picture of what she might look like as a teenager. On May 13th, 2023, a woman was doing her shopping at the Westgate Regional Shopping Center in Asheville, North Carolina. At upmarket consignment shop, Plato's Closet, the woman spotted a mother and her daughter. The woman recognized Heather Unbehaun and recalled that the child was missing. She saw the pictures on Unsolved Mysteries. The woman informed an employee of her suspicion. The store employee immediately contacted Asheville Police, who contacted South Elgin Police. Police officers then confirmed the identities of the two individuals as Heather and 15-year-old Kayla Unbehaun. 40-year-old Unbehaun was subsequently taken into custody. Kayla was quickly reunited with her father. Ryan said in a statement issued through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children that he was overjoyed that Kayla is home safe. I want to thank the South Elgin Police Department, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and all of the law enforcement agencies who assisted with her case, Ryan continued. I also want to thank all of the followers on the Bring Kayla Home Facebook page, who helped keep her story alive and were instrumental in spreading awareness. We ask for privacy as we get to know each other again and navigate this new beginning. South Elgin Chief of Police Jerry Krauschik also thanked citizens across the country and other law enforcement agencies who worked so dedicatedly to help bring Kayla home. We are overjoyed to report that the child is in good condition and in good spirits since being reunited with her father, he said in a release. Following Unbehound's arrest in Buncombe County, she was charged with the felony offense of extradition, which she declined to waive. She posted $25,000 bond and was released from custody. 
then turned herself in the following day in Kane County, Illinois, where she was booked on an abduction charge. The 40-year-old appeared before Judge Julia Yetter on May 18, 2023, and was released on bond with an electronic monitoring device. Ryan obtained an order of protection against Unbehaun, who is barred from being within 1,000 feet of his house and cannot leave Illinois without court permission. Unbehaun's next scheduled court date is June 14, 2023. A Class 4 felony in Illinois can carry a sentence of one to three years, often probationary. 49-year-old Larry Fuller lived in Ignacio, Colorado in 2009. He worked as a diesel mechanic. Larry was married to Paula Silva, and the couple had four children together. They lived in Colorado since 2000. On the evening of December 31st, 2008, Larry and Paula went to the Sidekick Bar at 677 Goddard Avenue to celebrate New Year's. Walking home, Larry was shot by an unknown perpetrator. It was less than two hours into the new year. He succumbed to his injuries at the scene. Investigators at first believed the motive may have stemmed from an altercation that took place at the bar, but Paula told them that the couple had stayed out of any conflicts that night. Unfortunately, there were no witnesses and no real leads for investigators to go on. The case soon grew cold. Sadly, Paula Silva passed away in 2015 without ever learning who was responsible for taking her husband's life. In February of 2023, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation became the lead investigatory agency on the case at the request of the Ignacio Police Department. The agency put out a renewed request for the public's help. A lot of interviews were conducted by investigators and it finally paid off. On May 18, 2023, 38-year-old David Hendren was arrested at the Navajo Nation in Arizona and was charged with taking Larry's life. Colorado Bureau of Investigation spokeswoman Lisa Kohlbrenner had this to say in a news release. Through the course of this years-long investigation, witness interviews were conducted by CBI which subsequently led to David Hendren's identification and arrest. Kohlbrenner said the arrest is sealed and the agency cannot offer further comment on the case. Details such as where Fuller was shot, how many times and the weapon used have not been released. Monica Escalante, Paul Silva's daughter, said her mother never got over what happened to her stepfather she called the arrest unreal. Monica said the investigator who informed her of Hendren's arrest said Hendren told authorities he did not mean to take Larry's life, but had mistaken him for someone else. I never thought, ever, that they were going to figure it out, Monica said. It's like a dream come true. Monica was 25 at the time of Larry's demise. Larry was like a father to Monica, and she described him as a deeply caring and capable person. Larry's slaying haunted the family, Monica said. For years, she and her two brothers heard rumors in the community that various people had been involved. You just lived in fear, Monica said. And my mom, I don't think she ever healed from it. If she was alive, she would probably cry her heart out, out of happiness and sadness. David Hendren is currently awaiting extradition to Durango, where he will be jailed by the La Plata County Sheriff's Office. Sixteen-year-old Sarah Yarborough lived in Federal Way, Washington, with her parents and 11-year-old brother Andrew. Federal Way is a coastal city near Tacoma. Sarah attended Federal High School, where she was an honor student and drill team member. She loved art and dancing. On the morning of December 14, 1991, 
she drove to her high school to attend a drill team event. A few hours later, at 9.40 a.m., two boys walking in the woods outside Federal High School stumbled upon a body. It was Sarah Yarborough's. The two boys had cut through a patch of bushes as a shortcut on their way to school when they made the horrific discovery. Sarah was found wearing her skirt and a sweater with her stockings wrapped around her neck. She had been strangled and assaulted. Investigators found and collected DNA from the perpetrator at the crime scene and stored it for further use. Sarah's car was found in the school parking lot. Investigators found nothing in the car that led them any closer to the attacker. The two boys and a jogger, also in the area that morning, worked with investigators to help create a sketch of a potential suspect seen shortly before Sarah's body was found. The unknown man had been seen leaving the bushes in a hurry and kept shooting the witnesses a series of suspicious glances as he trudged away from the crime scene. The sketch was shared around, but unfortunately, no one came forward that recognized the man. Students and staff at the high school were questioned, but investigators were unable to obtain useful information. With no real leads, the case grew cold. It was only in 2019, after using familial DNA, that police matched DNA from the crime scene to someone. Sarah's case was the first cold case to use genetic genealogy to generate investigative leads, according to Identifinders International. The man responsible was identified as Patrick Leon Nicholas. Nicholas was finally arrested by the King County Sheriff's Office in October 2019 while sitting at a bar in Kent, Washington. Nicholas's trial started on April 17, 2023 at the Norm Malang Regional Justice Center in Kent. During his two-and-a-half-week trial, Senior Deputy Prosecutor Celia Lee told jurors that Nicholas provided investigators with critical corroborating information before realizing he was a suspect. She also said, after leaving the safety of her car, her assailant led or dragged her into the bushes where her lifeless body was found. And as she was attacked, Yarborough scratched at the man as she fought for her life. Experts showed that DNA collected from under Sarah's fingernails and male DNA on her clothing came from a single male contributor. For years, the state admitted during the trial the DNA was run through the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, a database that has led to convictions in several cold cases. But CODIS never helped with Sarah's case. In 2019, King County Detective Kathleen Decker uploaded crime scene DNA to a different database and came back with two possible matches, Nicholas and his brother. The brother already had his DNA in the federal database. Eliminating him was easy enough for investigators. So detectives began surveilling Nicholas. They ultimately collected some cigarette butts and a used napkin he threw away at a strip mall. Then state police tested the DNA. They found their match. Had we had the opportunity and the ability years ago to run familial testing, we would have identified, conceivably, that brother, and it would have helped us to narrow down and figure out who ultimately was responsible for this particular crime, said Detective Kathy Decker. On May 10th, 2023, Patrick Leon Nicholas was found guilty of all the charges against him by a jury. Judge Josephine Wiggins handed Nicholas a 45-year and 8-month sentence. This is virtually a life sentence for the 59-year-old. Sarah's mom, Laura Yarborough, had this to say, We lived the last 30 years wondering when and if someone was going to be arrested, and knowing that was kind of a Damocles sword hanging over your head, 
and you never knew when it's going to fall. When we lost her, our family was irrevocably changed. The trial's like a marathon. It's a slog. I didn't realize it was going to be quite this draining or exhausting or go on so long, said Laura. This conviction is not Nicholas's first time getting the maximum sentence either. In 1983, he was convicted of first-degree assault and sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was released after a little more than three years. The victim in that case, Anne Crony, also gave the victim impact statement, bravely facing Nicholas in court once again. Why was a repeat offender allowed to be released after serving less than half his sentence? Asked Anne. She also said Nicholas had two assault convictions prior to her attack that started with a seemingly friendly conversation at her car. He reached through the open driver's window and put a knife to my throat and told me to take off my clothes, she said. And I ran as fast as I could and dove into the river, and I swam harder than I ever swam before until I couldn't anymore. If he had still been in prison, he would not have been around to take away our daughter, Laura Yarborough said. The family said nothing will bring Sarah back or take away the pain they feel daily, but they get some comfort knowing Nicholas won't be able to hurt anyone else. Sarah's younger brother, Andrew, also spoke. He does not possess the ability to experience remorse or feel emotions the way normal people do. He does not belong in the free society with the rest of the people in this room. I recall the pain in my father's voice over the phone telling me that Sarah was not alive anymore. I recall the sounds of my parents crying through the walls at night as I laid in bed. Nicholas was also ordered to pay restitution to the Yarborough family. The amount will be determined at a later date. Sarah's family added they're extremely grateful to every investigator who has worked so hard over the last 30 plus years to bring Sarah's slayer to justice. 59-year-old Carol Reef lived in Gloucester Township, New Jersey. She had an apartment in the Lakeview Apartment Complex. On June 21, 2013, Gloucester Township Police Department officers responded to the Lakeview Apartment Complex to check on Carol after she never showed up to a planned trip with family members and was not answering her phone. When officers got into her apartment, Carol was not there. Her keys were still in her apartment and her car was in the parking lot. She was subsequently officially reported as missing. Then, four days later, detectives found Carol Reef's remains in a wooded area behind an old maintenance building for the complex, located off Lower Landing Road, not far from Route 42. An autopsy was unable to determine what exactly happened to her due to decomposition. During the initial investigation, Potential DNA evidence was recovered from a pair of Carol's jeans, as well as an empty beer bottle in her apartment. Unfortunately, at the time, DNA testing did not produce conclusive results. Over the years, advances in DNA analysis have helped open new doors in the investigation, specifically equipment that can collect evidence, leaving the hope that the perpetrator would soon be found. Detective Jeremy Jankowski of the Camden County Prosecutor's Office said, It has always been my hope that when they close this, it's going to protect other people from having to suffer through this as a family and for the loss of life. Then, on May 11, 2023, 59-year-old Joseph Grizoff was arrested and charged with taking Carol Reef's life. Grizoff was arrested by the U.S. Marshals Service Camden Division in Moorestown. He was then held at the Camden County Correctional Facility as he awaits a detention hearing. Following the arrest, detectives revealed Grizoff, who was a maintenance worker who lived near Carol's apartment, 
was interviewed at the time her body was discovered. Officials said Grissoff told police during that interview that he would regularly see Carol outside and admitted to complimenting her in the past. He also claimed that he had never been inside her apartment. Despite that claim, recent DNA testing revealed the strong proposition that Carol and Grissoff were both contributors to DNA profiles obtained from the jeans and the beer bottle that were found in Carol's apartment. Gloucester Township Police Chief David Harkins said, The Gloucester Township Police Department and the Camden County Prosecutor's Office have never forgotten about Carol Reef. Since her disappearance on June 21, 2013, and the discovery of her body on June 24, 2013, we have worked to get justice for Ms. Reef and her family. We will use all means necessary to achieve justice and prosecute those responsible. It is our duty to be the voice for victims and their families, and we take this responsibility very seriously. I am very proud of the collaboration and teamwork of the detectives who have worked countless hours which led to this arrest today. In August of 2014, human remains were found in the trunk of a car in the 2700 block of Plowhatton Street near the intersection with Seminary Street in Alton, Illinois. Those remains were identified as those of Jose Randolfo Pagoda, a Honduran national 52 years old at the time. The identification leaned heavily on DNA science due to the level of decomposition of the body. At about the same time, a Mexican national who was in the country illegally was identified as a suspect. He is Odilon Villagran Gudino. In April of 2021, he was arrested in Mexico. On May 16, 2023, the 56-year-old was extradited to the United States and is now in custody at the Madison County Jail. Unfortunately, there is not a lot more information on this case. <laughs>